Salute is a program for and about men and women who have served our country. Our program includes news about the laws that affect veterans, information on benefits and services, and news from veterans organizations. And now, our host, Bob Peters. Hello and welcome to Salute. I'm your host, Bob Peters, and with me is Mr. Tony Skies, who is a uh, Korean veteran pilot, and I want to welcome you to the show, sir. Nice to have you here. Well, thank you for having me. Where, did, where are you originally from? Kentucky. Kentucky. Oh, a bluegrass yeah. state. Yes. Pretty state. Yep. So uh, tell us a little about yourself uh, and uh, how did you come about you being a, you're an Air Force veteran. Okay. Well, I was born and raised in, in Kentucky from an old uh, first, uh, actually my uh, great-great-grandfather came in with the Daniel Boone's group. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow, we got some history here then, huh? Yeah. Uh, I uh, got out of high school in 1946, and uh, the World War II was just getting over. And I wanted, I was only 16, but I wanted to uh, get into the uh, Naval Aviation Cadet Program, and my father wouldn't sign the the records to let me go in. So I went to college, St. Louis University. Spent four years there. Uh, I ended up uh, with a bachelor's degree in biology, but I wanted to fly. And before I got out, the Air Force had a, uh, a uh, program where they came to the university and they, um, they had a little pitch and they said uh, anyone who applies can sign their name, can get in. And we'll get you some dress blues. Yes. So I went over to um, Illinois to uh, Air Field over there and, and took all their tests. And, in um, uh, uh, in August, I did that in in uh, June and August. Uh, they called me up, and I went down to Perrin Air Force Base in northern uh, Texas. Mm. You were telling me something that I'd really like the people to know about that. Uh, you're not the only one in the family that was in, right? No. Had and tell five. me a little story about why you didn't get in at 16. <laughs> well, I had five brothers in, in World War II. Every one of them was in combat at one place or the other, and uh, some of them in the Pacific, and uh, uh, two of them, uh, three of them in uh, uh, Europe, and also in, one of them was in Europe, and then was in, uh, in a, um, invasion in the Aleutians. Uh, but uh, um, I had one brother that his ship was sunk, and he was one of eight survivors. Wow. And he was, he had been, uh, back was burnt from the ship blowing up, and he had to swim three miles to shore in Sicily, and uh, then went in and joined the uh, Air Force uh, 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 oh, they're, they're um, ones that uh, paratroopers, and uh, he fought fought with them for two weeks before they could get him out. Mm. Well, it's a lot of history there. Uh, okay, so now now you 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 joined the Air Force, mm -hmm. and you go where? My first uh, base was at uh, Perrin Air Force Base in uh, Texas. I uh, had uh, uh, seven months there, and then went out to Lubbock, Texas, Reese Air Force Base, and uh, graduated there in B-25s. And uh, as soon as I graduated, got married, and. Uh, but I, uh, uh, I, uh, 
and was immediately assigned to fighter squadron. A new plane that they had just come out was, was the F-94, which was a fighter interceptor, all-weather fighter interceptor squadron. So I flew that up in Texas, in, um, in, uh, uh, in New Jersey at, at uh, McGuire Air Force Base. And, uh, and uh, that's, which is part of Fort Dix. Uh, I then was uh, given orders to go to Korea in uh, January of 1953. That other plane, is that the one you were telling me about was uh, basically all instrument? You didn't really see where you were going? or? Yes, uh, all other interceptors were those who uh, you didn't have a limit that you had to have to land. Uh, they guided you down, and you just had to believe they knew what they were doing. <laughs> yeah, I hope the guy on the ground wasn't having a bad day, huh? Well, uh, you, you knew you were on the ground when you felt it. Mm. But uh, uh, in that plane, I had a um, radar operator that flew in the back seat. He was supposed to make sure that I didn't hit anything. Yeah. Okay, so then uh, you said after that you, you headed off to Korea. Yes. Because you've flown several different planes you were telling me about. Yes. So tell us a little bit about uh, Korea. Well, when I um, uh, got to uh, Japan and route to Korea, uh, the uh, Air Force decided that they had enough pilots of my MOS in Korea at that time, and so they put me in a squadron there in Japan that was flying uh, uh, the interceptors uh, protecting the coast of Korea. And uh, I flew there for 18 months, uh, and we were, we were, it was usually a, uh, quite a day because we were up at 5 o'clock on the flight line at 5.30 and, and taken off just at daylight. Yeah, and what was, you were telling me about the, uh, the planes and what, you know, why you were flying back and forth and the, the Russian planes. You, tell us a little bit about that. Tell the people at home about that. All of that. Well, uh, back in that time period, uh, there was such a thing as a combat takeoff, and that's where they needed a lot of planes taken off at one time. So uh, in Japan at Masawa Air Force Base, the Russians had been flying a small uh, prop plane over our base and taking pictures at night. And it was flying so slow that these jet planes couldn't get to it, and eventually one of them managed to shoot it down. And when they did, the next morning there were 200 Russian planes sitting on the other side of the waterway between the, the Japanese Northern Island and, and the uh, island that the Russians had. Uh, when uh, we got word that they were there, uh, the Air Force decided that they were going to take everything we had at our base, which was 200 planes. And uh, we, so it, by uh, starting at 5.30 that morning, uh, we took three abreast, three abreast at a time every 30 seconds until we got all 200 planes off and flew them up to the Masawa Air Force Base. And, uh, we stayed there for three days flying backwards and forth, looking at the Russians flying backwards and forth on the other side. And they're looking at you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, one morning we woke up and there wasn't any planes over there. So we headed back to our bases in, in Japan, which my base was at Johnson Air Force Base near Tokyo. And uh, by the time we I, we got back there. My plane had um, 
was running out of fuel and the light was telling me it was time to get on the ground. And so I, I was in the flight of four and they put me off first to, to drop me off. And I came in a little bit fast and then I realized before I got to the end of the runway that I wasn't going to stop. And the problem with that was that at the other end of the runway there was a 300 foot cliff. And so I decided I'd rather mess up my plane <laughs> than go, over, and the go over the cliff. So I yeah. pulled the gear up and slid right up with 100 feet of the drop off. You have a photo of that there. Uh... Yeah, that's the particular plane. That's the, what did you say, that's the F? Uh, 94. 94. Mm -hmm. And you can see it's it's sitting kind of low. You can put it down now so people can see that. Uh, it's sitting kind of low because the landing gear is gone. Yes. You I, bellied in on, the, yeah, on that one. Yeah, it just tore it off. Yeah, yeah. That had to be quite the ride, huh? Now, that's a two-seater? Uh no, I take it back. This actually, this one was an F eighty. Oh, F eighty. This is an F eighty. Okay. And um, it's it's single seat. I'm sorry. I, I flew both of them, but at this particular time, I was flying F eighties. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so then, then you, uh, they weren't too happy with that, but those things happen, right? Well, I thought so. Yeah. <laughs> There used to be an old saying in the Navy that if you could walk away from a plane crash, it was a good landing. Yeah, that's true. I'm sure that had, that had to do a lot with the Navy with the car uh, carriers, too. Yes. Because mm -hmm. they used to, well, that was something during World War II. But that's another story. Okay, so uh, after that, what happened after that? You got other pictures there you wanted to show us. Uh, okay. Well, here's one that is kind of interesting and at the base I was at our BOQ was a kamikaze training camp for the Japanese during World War II mm -hmm. and uh, so this is a remnant of their field there and this thing is called a Baka bomb and it is attached to the bottom of a of a, um, a, a, a bomber plane of some sort. And they would pull them uh, until they uh, got over the fleets, U.S. fleets. And then they'd let them loose. And they, they uh, then had fuel to get just as far as the ships were. And they couldn't get out of the, the cockpit. They were locked in. Yeah, and so they hit several of our planes with it. So that's like those you call. We we'll put uh, put it down for a minute, uh, just so I can ask you. Uh, they say kamikaze. That's not the same as a. I guess it is same like, thing. Same thing, but yeah. you know the others were uh, like well, fighter planes that they would just they go just down flew in. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, well, yeah. these these was a, a a plane. These were a plane. But they had wings, and they could be guided. Mm -hmm. But they're only going to go so far. That's right, and they had no wheels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it it was one they made specifically to drop, and then it was primarily um, uh, dynamite. Wow. Wow. And you uh, you have another picture there reviewing a. Uh, in one of your planes there. This one? Yeah, that one, yeah. yeah here. That's the F-86, which is a plane we got at a later time. And uh, this uh, came out. Yeah. yeah, we have a model of it there too, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, but you don't have to pick that up. Yeah. I'm going to let you drop it's, it. F-86 was was a, a real uh, powerful uh, new fighter plane. Yeah, you were telling me about it. This is like, you know, you had the older planes and this is, uh, 
a, a, the high tech end of a plane. So there was a yes. period of adjustment, right? Yes. For, especially for the World War II pilots and stuff. That's right. And how fast did you say that went? Uh, it would go to the mark. You yeah, could, you could is, hit them off. Which is something yeah. never, they never really did before. No, that was the first plane they had that did it. Um, the, when they made this plane, uh, nobody thought about uh, what uh, the, about uh, what, how do you teach the pilot that the, uh, when you use the, uh, like the, the stick to pull, make the plane go up or down, you knew when to slow down or, or, or not. Mm -hmm. uh, in this one, it had no resistance. And uh, it, as a matter of fact, before I took this flight one day, there had been five pilots killed of uh, trying to fly the plane and, and not understand what had happened. And this one did not have, it had hydraulic controls and it, uh, and it had um, uh, a, a more powerful engine in it. And uh, when, you, uh, when you used the controls, you didn't know that you were going too far. And particularly if you got excited about it. Yeah. And so if you pull the stick back too far, the plane would go straight up. And at one point in my flight one day, uh, I was doing some, some uh, test flights with other pilots. And, um, you said you were doing a, like a mock uh, dog fight dog or something. Fight. Yeah. And, um, when I pulled back on the stick, I didn't realize what I had done, and the plane went right straight up to 20,000 feet. And, uh, uh, and when I let loose of it, or when I pushed forward to stop it, it went straight down. And so then I'm pulling to go up, and I'm pushing to go down. And in that time period, this is what the Air Force called a porpoise. The plane was going straight up. When it got to a point, it would go, even if it, if it got to where it couldn't fly and uh, uh, soar anymore, it would go straight down. It just turned yeah, and go straight like down. Like a porpoise does in the ocean. That's right. And um, uh, it, in my particular case, it did it, hit my helmet on the top of the canopy ten times, enough to leave dents in my helmet. And uh, uh, about that time, uh, I was actually I was uh, unconscious for just a short period of time. But when I realized what was going on, I realized that I had to take my hands off the controls. Mm -hmm. And when I did that, the plane leveled out on its own. And, uh, only problem was that in the meantime, the plane had flamed out, uh, caught on the uh, engine um, area, had caught on fire, and uh, I was. Uh, so I now, you're, now, you're, now you're flying around, you're on fire. Right, and the plane quit, the engine mm -hmm. quit. Uh, I'm, I have nothing, I have no, no power or anything. And I managed to control the plane at 1,500 feet. And, uh, That's not very high. No. Uh, so uh, they, um, I got orders to eject. But uh, I decided if I dropped that plane into um, the area of Tokyo while it was over, I would kill a lot of people because I'd just set them all on fire. Mm. So I decided to try to get it away from the city. And I got it as far as uh, an old airport, and I got to the edge of it and hit the trees at the edge and actually uh, managed to slide into the grass overruns. 
And then I got out, and I thought I had going to get a medal. But? But <laughs> when I... Some people weren't happy. Some people wasn't happy. The, um, the colonel that was in control that day, uh, we, I had tore up one of his new F-86s. And he was waiting for me to crawl out of the plane. And he didn't like it at all. And he talked to me all the way back to the base. But uh, some cooler heads prevailed, eh? Yes, my base commander decided that um, he was a little, I don't know what you call that, but he, he got carried away. Misguided. Yes. Yeah. Which, uh, it's, you didn't know that. At the time, you just climbed out of that plane. You, didn't, you, didn't, you must have been hurting or no? Well, I, uh, uh, I don't know. I was kind of dazed. Yeah, disorientated and everything. Yes, uh -huh. and uh, just to get on the ground was a blessing for me. Yeah. And so I crawled out of the plane and went over and sat down. And uh, the, about that time, the fire trucks came out and put the fire out. But their colonel was waiting for me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. But uh, you didn't realize it, but many, many years later, this hence the collar, right? Well, I, I, as a matter of fact, I went to... Um, to the mess, uh, to the um, uh, hospital there. Or the yeah, the base hospital, mm -hmm. uh, because I was having pain in in my neck and, and shooting pains, and uh, so I went over and they took X-rays, but they couldn't find anything. So, uh, being a good, stout, strong man that never cries about anything. I went on back to back to base and started flying again. Yeah. And then uh, but it wasn't until uh, 2000 that they finally figured out what it was, huh? Well, it actually had broken your neck, really? It, it really had, had broken my neck. What it did, it caused uh, uh, two different vertebrae to just ride over the other vertebrae. And uh, because it, it was exposing the spinal cord. Mm. <clears throat> and uh, I, uh, I lived for, from 1954 uh, until uh, 19 and uh, until 2000, when it got so bad that it was cutting so far in my spinal cord that I couldn't walk or eat or do anything. And I went to a Mayo Clinic, and they couldn't find what was wrong. And so they were going to put me on pain control. Uh, I told them I'd been on pain control for 50 years. <laughs> yeah. But uh, anyway, before I decided, before I got on any of their, their um, program, uh, the uh, doctor at the time said, I'm going to try something different for you. I've never done this before. And he took the x-rays in a different way than they had ever done before. And whenever I had moved my neck real strong to a side, uh, then it exposed where these two, these four vertebrae were doing. Yeah. And uh, so he stopped immediately. And uh, within uh, two days' time, they fused my neck, my first and second cervical vertebrae. And uh, he thought he had cured it, and which I guess he probably had, except the pain was not as bad, uh, it, but it was still there. Mm. Every day when I moved my head, the pain still hurts, and I, I 
have it till today. Yeah. Well, you're you're moving around anyway, you know, and so. Uh, I, well, I have I can't move my head too far to a side or up or down, yeah. and you notice when I'm sitting or talking to you. Yeah. I'm not moving my head a whole lot, but I get over. Uh, it doesn't go more than about uh, uh, half of an inch. Yeah. Until the pain starts well, more. I, I give you a lot of credit, my friend. Uh, so you did go back to flying after this accident for a while, right? Because we're yeah. almost running out of time. But I want to. Well, you, you flew. You, how many missions did you say you flew? Uh, well, I flew uh, during my career thirteen hundred uh, missions. Um, I did go back, and I flew from uh, from the. Uh, time of that accident until I got discharged from the service, and that was the end of my enlistment in August of two, uh, 1954. 1954. So then you come out of the service, and uh, is that when you were telling me about it, the first time you met your, uh, when your, was it your boy or your daughter? Or yes, my son. Your son. Uh, that's you know, the first time, time I'd seen him. Yeah, you were over in Korea all the time. You know, you hadn't get to see your son until 18 months later, 18 right? 18 months after he was born. That, that just shows to show the sacrifice people make, you know, in the, in the military that uh, a lot of people don't know. I mean, it's tough not to see your kids <clears throat> and well, your wife. Well, um, the people don't understand um, about Korea or Nam or even what they're doing today. They're taking these missions and spending three months or six months or something over in the far Middle East. Um, that they've given up a lot of their life, yeah, because they're not with that child or their wife for all that period of time. Well put, my friend. But I'm almost out of time. Uh, but I want to thank you for coming on. And I, I know after you got out of the service, you uh, you had a tough time getting a job. You said right? Yes. I, I eventually, uh, my dad let me have his, uh, he had a state farm insurance agency, and he let me take that over. And I did that until I learned how to sell yeah. insurance. Well, I'm sure we could talk quite a bit more about uh, everything, Tony, but uh, unfortunately, I am out of time. Yep. And uh, I want to thank you for your service. Uh, you know, a lot of people, uh, don't get injured, you know, but people do get injured and it's nice to, you know, I'm, I'm happy to have, to have met you is what I'm trying to say, I guess, you know, and I appreciate what you did and I... Well, uh, I, I thank you for having me on, on here and I, I, I want people to know that when we go into the service and we put our life on the line, we do it for our country. Amen. With that being said, I have to say goodbye. So to all our active military and our veterans and their families, we salute you for all you do. Till next time. Now we hope. This is our fourth year at Lakefront TV. We're still looking for guests, and we'd love to have you on. We're proud of what we've done in the past. So give us a call at 352-728-9707 and check us out on the Internet at lakefronttv.com. Spread the word and enjoy the show.